Good morning, everyone. <laughs> oh my gosh, we're starting to wind down a little after this this vibrant time together, and it's so precious. And yeah, I think we'll have a a deep session going into things, and we do want to hear from you what's going on, what's in your mind, and also, yeah, this is usually the time in the retreat where we are just praying. A lot of times people are saying, wow, I had these, this insight, this insight, this realization, this insight, and then, and now, what's next? So sometimes we call it next steps. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. Yeah, so that's what we'll do this morning. We'll have a session together now. So it's our last sort of Q&A kind of session to pour out your heart or just ask questions. And then uh, we'll take a little bathroom break after our session this morning. And then you can come back in and then we will have Linda come on the big screen from Mexico. Because she is our next steps kind of angel. <laughs> You're like, how can I stay plugged in? What can I do now? You know, and then and also what else poss what other possibilities could there be that I can pray into and see where I can plug in? So she'll come in and Yiska and Susanna will be here too to just open that up and just still answer any questions and share any other context of ways to stay linked in the mind. And then uh Jeffrey has the whole schedule, but <laughs> it sounds like I'm doing it this <laughs> afternoon. Then there'll be like a room clean in the afternoon time um, rather than function so that that's all can t taken care of and done today. And then we'll come back tonight for um, a closing session, which will be your opportunity to really share your miracles, insights, yeah. Gratitude, what's just really bubbling on your heart. Um, if your prayer was answered, <laughs> how your prayer was answered. So that will be this evening. Yeah, I think too with um, with Linda, you know, I, I came in a few times with the, the strawberry clips. I, I walked in that one time and I saw the strawberry clip. Mm. Linda was the one who, that was her f first time coming across the ocean to participate in in the strawberry, and she was the one dancing around like a fairy in a sprite, and looked like she was an elf, and then closing herself up in the hammock, and you know, so, but she had been like feeling that for some some years, just immersing in the uh, online materials uh, digitally, and then this was her chance to kind of come and spring out, and she was like a little fairy, couldn't contain her her enthusiasm. And we did a lot of prayer with that because it was a very big strawberry gathering that Tarana Singh came all the way from a, a Bollywood actress from from India. I remember we were just getting ready for strawberry and Jason's like, there's, a, there's an Indian woman, she's an actress, she's contacted me, she wants to come. I said, okay, let's see what the spirit has. You know, it was like people started coming from all over the world. But it was also one where, you know, we always stay in prayer with everything and basically we were hearing, yep, it's time for Linda to come, Linda's to come. Oh, and there's, she's supposed to be paired up with somebody, who is it, Pete? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Pete, he's in Mexico, we better get him a ticket. <laughs> so they kind of came up and then they kind of came together and, in, just recently, in the last few months, I was telling him, yeah, it was kind of all pre-arranged. Uh, it was Holy Spirit matchmaking. <laughs> uh, we had to get Pete a ticket, and then their first reactions when they saw each other and everything. And eventually I kind of married them uh, in, outside in the yard in the temple beside that. But there's a lot of, it starts to give you the feel that everything's part of a pre-arranged plan. And we're simply just tuning in and listening to instructions from, I call it JC Central. Uh, okay, what? Okay, what? Pete? We're supposed to get Pete? Okay, it's just her first, okay, get, get Pete a ticket. 
He was all excited. You know, it was, but it's all part of a prearranged plan, and it's fun to think of it that way, because that way it starts to loosen up from this individual weight of, I got to make the decisions, I hope I make the right decisions, I hope I'm following the guidance, I hope I'm listening, when really it's, you can really start to enjoy and relax and just watch what has already happened. Then it really gets lighter. <laughs> I'm just watching what's already happened and then, yeah, Jesus says, yeah, check out Workbook Lesson 158, you know. We're, we're just looking back, watching uh, what has already happened, um, literally just as if it's still going on. Uh, it's not pretending, it's just watching it as if it's still there. But that's that detachment that you hear the, the, the avatars and the masters and the saints talk about. The observer and the observed are one. Uh, this union feeling of peace and calm and tranquility of just, no matter what's going on on the screen, you know, you could be on a beach looking and just looking at the sky and look down and there's like a 65-foot tsunami just about to wash you <laughs> like an ant. <laughs> five miles in, inland, and you're just going, look at that beautiful wave, it's uh, 40, 45 feet tall, wow! And then just totally enjoy it uh, from a higher perspective than an ant. <laughs> Wham! <laughs> Talk about getting flooded, <laughs> getting swept away by the glory of God. So, actually, you know, that's what what it's about is like you just keep praying and you get your little nudges, your intuitions, and then it's just the joy then of, of listen and follow what the prayer is and then just behold, just behold everything working in divine order without trying to divvy it up or divide up the good from the bad or the better from the worse and the, all these crazy dualistic comparisons that it's just the ego uh, pretending to be something. And uh, really there's nothing there. Nothing's happening at all. And when the more you start to feel that it's so involuntary, you're just swept up in an involuntary sense of joy. And, and if somebody says, what about this, this, this? You're like, you don't even have an answer because you're not thinking in terms of the form anymore. So, so anyway, does Jeffrey have some things to add with our schedule or do we cover everything? I think she pretty much covered it. Yeah, we'll have the session here, 15 minute break, and then we'll have Linda and uh, Susanna and Yiska. Then there'll be a little bit of time before lunch. And after lunch we'll be told about our cleaning pods and cleaning up our rooms and everything. We'll also be given the instructions for tomorrow and how to find our, where to get packed and find our drivers. And then we'll have dinner. And then after that, it'll be our closing session. So she pretty much covered everything. And there is a question. Sorry, is there no function today? There is no function today. As it stands right now, there may be an opportunity, depending on the time with the cleaning this afternoon, from what I understand. Right. I think, depending on what time the session closed, Susanna said, if the kitchen team, if, if there was spaciousness and someone felt the spark and the energy, then they could go in and just help prepare lunch. But... The team have got it, if not. So, it's all covered. And my friend Jagita from Lithuania today, she's been listening in on Spreaker. She's like, what? <laughs> There's someone from Lithuania there? Well, she said, I, I want to be there. <laughs> he said, don't complicate my life. <laughs> This is her and her husband and her child. You're safe. <laughs> brothers, three brothers, that's all it is. But, but basically, she was like, I, I really want to be there, but with my husband's work and my child, I, I can't. But I, she said, please put me in contact with this person. And so I just wrote back before I came over here, yes, okay, I will. <laughs> So, it's good. It's just, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm from Latvia, and it's 
neighbor country to Lithuania, mm -hmm. and we are uh, four practitioners of Course in Miracles. Now we will be seven in two countries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think she's living there anymore. I think she's maybe in, she's been in Germany and uh, taking trips with her family to Portugal and everything, but yeah, she definitely, I think uh, the whole uh, European phase of the plan is lighting up. So yeah, she just would love to be in contact. <laughs> But that happens so often. We'll often. Someone will often tell David, I'm the only person studying A Course in Miracles in my country. And David says, well, I'm glad you wrote to me <laughs> and forwards on a bunch of Mighty Companion contacts. So there's, it's often an underground. You know, you don't know like who's, who else is studying it. But once the connections are made, then, yeah, you're aware of how much support there is. <laughs> it's like the spirits just having fun orchestrating it. You remind me of that time when this, this woman wrote to me, she said, I'm the only Course in Miracles student in Belgium. And I said, oh, okay, nice to meet you and everything, knowing that she probably isn't, but, <laughs> but she, in her mind she is the only. And then the very next day, um, a man wrote to me, and said, I am the only Course in Miracles student in Belgium <laughs> on consecutive days. And I'm just kind of winking at JC Central like, oh, you've got, you're having some fun here. I mean, think of the odds <laughs> of that being by two different people on two consecutive days. So then I, I did a little call with both of them and I said, well, you both are Course in Miracles students. I said, I think you should maybe meet because they, they lived in Brussels. They both lived in Brussels. Mm -hmm. They lived in the same city. Wow. So I think you should go and meet. And then uh, the woman brought a friend of hers, a woman along. So the three of them met. And then like four days later, I get a message from them, from the three. They said, um, we only have one question and here's our question. Uh, we, we would like to invite you to Belgium and our one question is, can we keep you to ourselves or do we have to share you? And so I wrote back, share. So those three started and they met, they found out they weren't the only course, they started meeting people in Brussels and other towns and everything and one of them, that that they met was an American woman who was married to a, a man from Brussels and they had a farm. So they said, why don't we do a big gathering and a farm outside in rural Belgium. So I said, oh great, okay, I'll, I'm doing a tour over there so I'll come to the farm. And it was beautiful, it was muddy and there was animals and children and rabbits and uh, livestock and everything out there. And People came from seven different European countries, mostly Belgium and the countries, Germany and all the ones that were surrounding it. So it turned into an international gathering at a farm out there in nature where we were all just rejoiced together. But it did start with the two emails. I'm the only Course in Miracles student in Belgium. No, I'm the only. <laughs> and then, so it just shows that that's that's really the plan of awakening, you know, it's just these little nudges and prompts. It took a nudge, a prompt to write to me and then it took another one and then a meeting in, in like a, a restaurant and then share and then it turned into an international, uh, f I think it's one of the only farm <laughs> international gatherings I've ever done. I think I've been on farms before. I was in Sweden because a woman invited me, she said, please do a a retreat at the farm with me. We all, there's a lot of parents and we have a lot of children and we want you to do a whole discussion on parenting. How do you apply this uh, in practical ways with with children? Because we have a lot of questions. So that was in a farm too, but this, that was more just in rural Sweden with the big <coughs> red barn. This was like an international gathering in Belgium. So that's that's just a good example of how you can just enjoy the ride. Like really just follow the nudges and really enjoy the ride. And Jesus says in the Course, the willingness to communicate attracts communication. 
So think of it every time you get a nudge to reach out, extend, that willingness to communicate will be the beginnings of attracting a lot of witnesses to the mind in a joyful way. So it's kind of washing away that some of the old pathways to God were very much um, in, in caves or uh, in like secluded little houses and communities, secluded cloistered monasteries, cloistered convents, um, and Eastern and Western, you know, do this and rituals, wake up at 3.30 in the morning, you've got one set of rituals, then you get a second set of rituals, then a third set, go to bed early, wake up and do the same rituals. Um, and often there was seemingly seclusion and isolation, even in these little communities, which you'd think a community is drawing together of people, but they would be living very isolated lives, trying to pray their way to God. And, you know, some communities were, you know, don't look, that's why they were segregated with men in the monasteries and the women in the convent, because it don't look at an, an, someone from the opposite sex, sex, don't do this, don't do this, you know, you're going to mess up <laughs> your life. <laughs> if you have an interaction with a human being, oh, it's going to cost you. You know, and, and somehow, is this really what Jesus is <laughs> calling us to, to, to live uh, segregated, isolated, closed off lives? Uh, is that really how you devote yourself to God? But it's more like the, the traditions of the past were aware that as long as the five senses are involved, there's trouble. <laughs> as, long, as long as the five senses are involved, there's, there's big trouble. And so now with the Course in Miracles, Jesus is helping us navigate and saying, give me your five senses. Let me bring you into joy with these five senses. Like the, the uh, movie um, Tangled we saw, and, and especially with um, Frozen. Uh, we could see Elsa was like, everyone was so afraid of her magical powers that she was basically pushed down, shut, shut down, closed off, and, and she felt she had to do it. She didn't even want to shut down and shut off, but she felt like she had no other choice. And I think that's probably what's gone on with a lot of monasteries and convents. There was, underneath it, there was a sincere desire to go to God. But the ego was just all over the place, you know, in there really shutting things down that could be very useful. So, yeah, that's, isn't that exciting that we have a, a new way of living where we don't have to do the push away thing. You know, where we can welcome everybody with open arms because we are trusting the spirits in there guiding us and we're not afraid. We're not afraid. We're not afraid of, of our perceptions. We're not afraid of the five senses. We're, we're not afraid of, um, we're not afraid of miscreation. We're not afraid of misuse. We, we are, our way is set. We're in the tractor beam. Uh, the Spirit's got us now. There's, there is no turning back. And, and the ego is, it's, it's days are numbered. Let's just realize that. Now the tables have turned and now it's the ego that's like, scrambling for survival, but uh, yeah, it's effectively over. It is finished. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> Says Muna, her, her last retreat, she's like, it's over! It's over! <laughs> A big smile. It's a bit over with a big smile. <laughs> yeah, and it is such a beautiful adventure. Like David keeps saying, it's a fairy tale. It's like a fairy tale. And others would be like, what do you mean? What is that? But just watching over the years, you know, just watching this, it's unbelievable. And and we don't know what's coming in a really good way. 
like it's like Christmas is coming when you don't know what the presents are going to be. You know, we just don't know how God is going to use us and open us up to joy, to more joy, because that is the Spirit's direction. That's even in the lesson this morning. You know, it's about joy. It's like love and joy and and opening up to that. The Spirit of joy wants to live through us. And wants to extend through us. So it just, we have no idea you know, how skills and abilities are going to be used for the spirit in a way to lift our mind higher and higher. And that skills and abilities will emerge that we had no idea about. Like so many of us, we'd just hardly used computers. <laughs> you know? And we find ourselves building websites and web pages. <laughs> and it's all just... <coughs> based on this is what spirit would have me do. I have no idea how, but okay, let's go. <laughs> let's try it. You know, becoming more and more like children. I don't have the education for this. I don't know how to do it, but it ends up being more and more like playing. You know, as we just can listen and feel, feel the source of where it's coming from and connect in with that and let it show us the way. So it's so inspiring. So inspiring. I ended up playing a guitar and writing songs and coming here and playing music at a festival, having an album recorded from the festival and going on tour. <laughs> and Ricky, our musician rock star friend, was like, I've wanted to record an album for 10 years and you just, how did that happen? <laughs> how did that happen in one year? Yeah. You were, you were shown how to play guitar. You, you have seven songs. They're recorded. They're amazing. They're beautiful. And you're, what? <laughs> like, that takes so much work. And it was just being carried in the fairy tale of, it was, it was prayer. It was the answer to a prayer for me to learn how to pluck two strings on a guitar <laughs> when I was in a deep healing time. And then my prayer became a song. And the song was something I wanted to sing for myself four hours a day. You know, and it just naturally, naturally came out to like, what? You want me to sing in front of other people? What? You want me to sing with a microphone? <laughs> oh, wow, this is fun. <laughs> yeah, instead of like learning from a YouTube video, it, it didn't Greg get, and then you had your... A personal Greg Al, uh, the yeah, one, the one who we played, we played one of his songs <laughs> sent as a personal guitar instructor from Australia, <laughs> sent in, and then enough to then to sing the songs, then to record an album, to sing them in front of a lot of people, and then it just if that wasn't miraculous enough, and just throw in a world tour on top of that, you know, if it's just like it just <laughs> what. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it was all for just merging in the flow. It was all just for merging into the flow, not about any of the things or specifics. Those were just the little sprinkles, effects. But yeah, that was beautiful. Mm. Just surrender, that was a good example of surrender. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was all just for the deepening. We came, when I came here, it was, there was a strawberry festival was, was, was coming and I would heard the guidance come and arrive in Utah six weeks early and I thought why why six weeks early and then I arrived and Lila was down in the campground surrounded by papers and I walked in the door she said oh my god I can't believe you're here she said, my team just left. They had all this darkness coming up, and there were two of them. They were supposed to help me run the festival this year, and they left. So I was praying, okay, Jesus, it's just me and you. Who's going to help? <laughs> and I walk in the door, and I'm like, it's me. <laughs> so we prayed together, and we were to collaborate and run the festival. And then um, other volunteers started coming, and Eric was coming, and so... Eric said, oh, I want to hear your new song. Can you play it with me? And so I played one with him and he was like, oh, my God, got his guitar. And we just started collaborating. And we would just drop into these just mystical meditations, playing the songs together. And then another musician came, <laughs> Laura, for the festival. And the three of us started playing together. And it was so, their harmonies, they just 
took it to another level, you know, from my simple little songs. And then they were like, oh, wow, this feels like it is the festival. <coughs> so we ended up opening up every morning with a, instead of a sat sung, we called it a sat sing. <laughs> 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 and we just played these songs just with a few words, just a few words in between each one. So, oh, here we go. Quantum Love. Quantum Love album. <laughs> it's really turned into an anthem. <laughs>
That's a joy song. Yeah. <laughs> Quantum love. <laughs> Classic lines. It's quantum physics, baby. Love radiates undefined. <laughs> Jesus is having fun. <laughs> Einstein's with Jesus. Yeah, it's quantum physics, baby. Science, religion, the duality is burst. <laughs> It's all inclusive. It's all inclusive. One love, love one, one heart, heart, one, one mind. mind. Yeah. <laughs> Can't you see that Jesus and Einstein, arm, arm around Einstein with Einstein's hair flying all over the place. Jesus' hair flying all over the place. <laughs> and those two guys with their long hair <laughs> swaying, singing quantum physics. Yeah. One love, one heart, one mind. Yeah. That's it. It's just the end of duality. It's the end of these dualistic way of thinking opposites. It's yeah. It's it's hard. It's challenging. It's stressful to try to reconcile opposites since God didn't create opposites. God is one love. God creates love. You know, we can follow. Okay, we got it here on Earth. We get apples from apple trees. We get pears from pear trees. We get cherries from cherry trees. We get peaches from peach trees. And in heaven, love comes from love. God is love. God extends and Christ is an extension of that love. That's our identity, is Christ. Not a man, not a woman, not on the timeline of history. It's just, it says, Jesus' little life on earth was not enough to convey the vastness of the lesson that he learned, because he learned a lesson of divine mind. So that tiny little earth life, tiny little, maybe 33, 30, 45 years on earth, was not enough to teach the lesson. And, and that's our lesson, is divinity. Is that God's love is our love, that we are an extension of God's love. So. Even that little life on earth, you know, that seemed to have a, a crucifixion and a resurrection involved, you know. <clears throat> Jesus was not so big on the body or form. He called that, uh, basically that lifetime the, and that crucifixion, uh, the last useless journey. Whoa, this tiny little speck of an earth lifetime, and he's calling it the last useless journey. And he's saying, there's so much more to learn in your mind. Give all of your effort to the mind training. Because the lesson is in the mind, it's not in the body. You don't learn it in the body. In fact, it's more of an unlearning of everything that was learned to come to a recognition or a self-realization of what the Greeks called know thyself. So, so it's good. It's like you can start to just relax with like, <clears throat> you know, when you've been trying to climb a mountain and it's hard to climb the mountain. Or like Sisyphus with the ancient, you know, trying to push a boulder up, up a hill. That's what our human lives have been, trying to push a large boulder up a hill. And then Jesus is just like, stop, let go of the boulder, let it roll back down. You don't need to be fooling with the boulder. And here, come and parachute with me. Let's, let's just parachute to the valley, you know. We'll go paragliding instead of pushing a boulder up a mountain. We're just going paragliding. A little paraglide for two. You and Jesus just, psh, wee, just go in the wind, you know. And that requires just the, the willingness to let go of trying to be in charge of how your earth life should go. The problem is, is that for human beings, they're trying to use past learning to direct their future pursuits. And, <laughs> and neither really offer anything, the future pursuits or the past learning. Because the present moment is, is where we really parachute, parachute in spirit, you know, to the I am presence. It's so light. So that's, 
that's in our heart that's what we wish for you a light joyful happy life of extending God, god's love and and giving up the struggle and then going and just living an intuitive life instead of trying to react to the forms of the world instead of reacting and reacting to the form which is really just the way the ego set it up that you would react to the form just say no i'm going to i'm just going to be quiet and intuitive and i'm not really going to do anything unless i really feel it as so i really feel it 100% in my heart then i'm all yours just just tell me what you want and I'll do it. I'll do it joyfully, I'll do it gleefully. I won't do it with resentment or a sense of, of heaviness or a sense of work. I did a video one time, I think it was titled a, a, a short on, maybe Andy made a short out of it, was something about um, happiness does not require effort or something like that, one of those videos, something like that. Happiness requires no effort. In other words, we're used to effort being one of those things. Initially, when we first get in the journey, it seems to take effort to meditate, it takes effort to read the course, it takes effort to do your course lessons. But the actual state of happiness is just a state of healing in what is. It's just, once you open to the happiness, then it's, there's no effort required. So you can't even reach a state of happiness and look back at the, at the war zone and say, ah, oh, I went through hell to get here. You know, you don't, you don't make it to heaven and tell your war stories. When you make it to heaven, there are no war stories. You, you forgot the war stories. <laughs> That's why it's heaven, because <laughs> you only remember the love. So it's taking us out of this linear thing of like, that you have to work hard and effort but more, it's more of a trust, surrender, willingness than it is of an efforting. And, and how wonderful to think your life can, can be more like, like going down a water slide in the summer and not holding on, not using your fingernails at all, just arms in, water slide, <laughs> splash, you know. I've always liked that water slide analogy, like that's it. Keep your hands, your fingernails in. Do not attempt to, to scrape the plastic. That will just slow, down, slow you down. You want a, a full release. And, and that's, that's a wonderful way to think of your life, going down a water slide and then whoosh. And when you get to the bottom, then Jesus is in there swimming around going, the water's warm. I kept telling you. I kept telling you. The water's warm. Come and splash with me. <laughs> Let's have a fun swim. You know, that's, that's a good kind of symbol to keep in mind when, when you feel like you're, you've been caught up into this efforting paradigm. Very sneaky, the ego, with its efforting. Yeah. We don't want that. <laughs> So, we, yeah, we feel to open it up. Mm -hmm. We've got the purple microphone. Jeffrey's got it in hand. There we go. <laughs> uh, so, in spite, you announced that ego is over, uh, but still, uh, still kind of a... <laughs> <laughs> You announced. <laughs> yeah, you announced, this, yes. uh, And uh, the still question for two days are kind of a breaking through me, and... Uh, the question is, uh, so I was practicing some seven years the Course in Miracles 24-7 on best effort basis, and I am glad how I done. Uh, but in that period, uh, I had quite a dark times, real kind of a hopeless. And, uh, and uh, recently, some half a year ago, in YouTube started to come informations about dark, uh, dark night of the soul. And somehow I related. So I have been going through this dark night of the soul. And my question is, is it uh, possible that uh, with practicing Course in Miracles in a way how here it is practiced in living in Miracles community, is it possible to escape dark uh, night of the soul? Or, yeah, it's just interesting for me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was John of the Cross that coined the phrase, dark 
Night of the Soul. And yeah, there was a lot of Christian mystics that, that wrote about the, the depth of the darkness and having to pass through the darkness. And, and Jesus mentions in the, the Course that, that you will doubt will come and go and go to come again, yet is the ending certain and you go through the darkness to the light. But um, I would say that it's, it's helpful for us now to start to <laughs> look at, always look at darkness, but, but see that, that it's optional. I think we're, let's use the word optional uh, with that. Because in even the words, even the phrase, dark night of the soul, Jesus has reminded me for the last 30 some years, the soul and the spirit are the same. They, they are the same. Uh, and that's why Jesus doesn't really get into individual souls because the spirit is the spirit. The soul and the spirit are synonymous. That's a good way to start thinking about the soul. Not that it's on a journey. <laughs> He says things in the Course like, you know, you know, you're on a journey to a home that you never left. Or, prepare ye now for the undoing of what never was. <laughs> He's like, did you get it? <laughs> did you get it? Did you get it? So, so maybe we can now go from those old kind of paradigms, which John of the Cross would be, with all the great mystics and saints, the lineage will say of all that, to, to just opening up to the idea that dark night of the soul would be saying dark night of the spirit. Because actually the spirit doesn't have a dark night. The spirit is God's love. God is. Jesus says in the workbook, he says, we say God is and then we cease to speak. Imagine that if the, those were the last two words that came out of your mouth. God is. Period. End of story. Fini. Finished. Done. We say God is and then we cease to speak. Because the soul doesn't actually have a dark night, you know. That's a perception of letting go of something that seems to be happening. I did hear that this morning he, he was saying to me, it was a question, can it really be difficult to let go of something that doesn't exist? That was what he was saying today. Can it really be difficult to let go of something that doesn't exist? You know, in the Course, they, they pepper Jesus with questions, questions, questions. One of them is, they ask Jesus, you know, how will the world end? Don't you want to know his answer to that? I mean, how's that for a direct question? How will the world end? And he says, he answers the question with a question. Can what had no beginning really have an end? <laughs> you know, that's, that's it. You can't help but remember to laugh when you have the, the question that signific seemingly significant of a question be answered with that question. Almost like it's just a playfulness with it. He's, 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 Jesus is an eternal playfulness. <laughs> is there any seriousness in Jesus? No. I, <laughs> because there's, there's joy, there's love, there's glee, there's happiness. Of course there's playfulness with that. Because eternity can afford to be playful. <laughs> it's, what's the threat? It's not like there's a, a boogeyman. Watch it. Don't get too playful. Don't get too j funny or humorous here. And eternity's like, did I hear something? No. <laughs> you know. So, so I think that's, that's what it is, is, is when we've gone into this, what you're calling living miracles, this is, is basically going into function, into purpose, in a very single way. Let thine eye be single, Jesus said in the Bible. In a very focused, single way. And that is really an invitation to, to happiness. It's an invitation to joy. It's an invitation to 
overlook the error. There's one part in the Course where Jesus said, the Holy Spirit doesn't see the error. So he says, look not to error. He's, he's asking us to truly forgive by not seeing what's not there, by seeing what's real, by seeing what's true. That's what he calls true empathy. So that's really the destiny of your life now, is to really embrace true empathy. And it could be anything. It could be anything, world events. It could be Hamas launching hundreds of missiles and the missiles going off and then in your mind there's this presence. Is there a problem? You know, it really is starting to take a deep look at, at pulling away from the false meanings that have been given to absolutely everything. We don't really know what attack is. God didn't create it, so we must, whatever ideas and concepts we have about attack, must need healing forgiveness. We don't really know what attack is. We can't talk about the scale of an attack unless we have some meaning already, some conceptual meaning of what it is. But if God is one, if love is one, if mind, if divine mind is one, there is no attack without the belief in duality. You have to have an attacker and an attackee to perpetuate this idea of attack and defense, of victim, victimizer. You cannot perpetuate victim and victimizer unless you have a basic error that's underneath. And, and the only reason that error could still be there is if you want to still hold on to it. It's not like, we're not required to have a dark night of the soul. It's not like Jesus is saying, oh yeah, you got to pay your dues. <laughs> yeah, okay, seven years, that's good now, but you got to face the dark night, you know, you got to pay your dues. No, you don't have to pay your dues. Jesus is saying, there are no dues. <laughs> God's love, God's grace <laughs> says there are no dues. There are no dues. There is no punishment. There is. Uh, there are no consequences. There is no heaviness in God's love. You know, it's it's like truly, truly a willingness to let go. So the only way we we start to come into that is is through a devotion to it. You know, if somebody came to you and said, "Are you willing to devote?" your full attention to happiness, <laughs> most people would go, tell me more, what, what does this entail? <laughs> what, what's required <laughs> to devote your full attention to happiness? Because remember, happiness is a state of mind, the Kingdom of Heaven is a state of mind. It's not, you don't have to get the, the effects of the world to line up in a certain way. That's the game we've played. I'll be happy when. I did that for years. I'll be happy when I, I have this kind of body, or this kind of partnership, or this kind of house, or this kind of career, or this kind of life in the world, you know. We somehow have these, these pictures, ima we imagine pictures. Ah, uh, I will arrive. I will arrive in my happy dream when the world looks this way. And Jesus is like, why wait for heaven? And why base it on these images being in a certain configuration when you can have it now? You know? Future happiness, he says, is not your just reward. Because for you have cause for freedom now. He's, he's pulling it back to the present moment again, yet again. For most of us, you know, if something started off with future happiness, that's got our attention. Future happiness, yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm here, okay. is not your just reward. Oh, <laughs> for you have cause for freedom now. <laughs> you know, that's that's him saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At hand, that's close. Even in human terms, <laughs> how far do I got to go? 
to your hand. <laughs> How far must I journey? To your hand. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I've got a, a YouTube video, it's that, uh, it's, it's of that workbook lesson, I rest in God, and the photo on it is just a, an arm and a hand up like this. <laughs> I rest in God. Just, just an arm and a hand, that's all it's got. So, so you can see that he's encouraging us to, to give ourselves over to that. He's saying, really, you're worthy of this. You have, you have cause for freedom now. So in terms of cause and effect, you know, I remember reading, 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 and after many years with the Course, I, I was like, so you're saying there are no causes and effects in the world? That's right. So, like even the law of physics, for every action there's a reaction, that's not true? That's right. So, everything I believe about cooking, if you cook something too long it will turn black. That's not true. That's right. If I don't cook something, you know, it, it's raw. That's the, that's right. Okay. So that takes away all my university, <laughs> everything I learned in ten years of university. That's wiped with that. Okay, then what is the true cause-effect relationship? God, love is the cause, and your identity is the effect. That's a true cause-effect relationship. That's the, the creator and the creation is a true cause-effect relationship. That's a fact. The rest is not. That's, the rest is, is fake news. <laughs> the cosmos is fake news. So the next time you hear on the TV and one of your favorite politicians says, it's just fake news, just remember, Jesus agrees that the whole cosmos is fake news. Mother Nature is fake news. Global warming is fake news. Everything, terrorism, fake news. And everything else, <laughs> and everything else, but, but with joy. Because, because the Creator, God is real and God's creation is real. And that's a fact. And that's what, what the Bible calls, you know, the good news. That's the good news. <laughs> Love is the good news. It's not some theology about, you know, heaven and hell and all this and that. That's not the good news. The good news is love. Love is real. Joy is real. Spirit is real. That's, that's good news. I am spirit. That's a workbook lesson. That, that lesson, I am spirit, it doesn't have a perceptual component to it. There's not a bit of perception in that lesson. Another one, I am as God created me. Is there a dark night of the soul? I am as God created me. <laughs> Leaves the question in the dust. <laughs> like a rocket going off. So thank you. That's, I'm glad you brought that up. That's Yes, thank you. Now I see that the uh, ego is really over, because he cannot uh, get even satisfying answers. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. Because I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried. I can't get no. <laughs> As we said, this is the last Q&A session, <laughs> and, and you've just, you're making the session shorter, uh, shorter than anything. Everyone's going to go out laughing out the door. <laughs> ha, 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 ha
<laughs> Joanna's being very brave. She's yeah. like, oh no, I have a question. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like there I'm, are good questions, though. Okay. I feel like I'm really going to lower the tone. Sorry. <laughs> um, I just. <laughs> I just couldn't stop myself asking this. Um, so I just read that Barbara and Robert Varley book about, I think, Peace is the Earnest. Um, and it kind of slightly freaked me out because, like, Holy Spirit was asking her to do some really weird things, like almost get raped. And, um, and then, and, and only, he, like, allowed them to have sex, like, after asking them to be celibate. Like, it just freaked me out a little bit because I was just thinking I kind of I felt like I'm never going to have any privacy again (laughs) I know that sounds weird but that was my kind of fear like why would he say yeah you have to be celibate for nine months then it's okay you can have sex now and put yourself in these dangerous positions I mean I get it like everyone's love and we extend love and then anyway I just wondered what you thought of that (laughs) Is that okay? Sorry, everyone. No, no. <laughs> no, no. no. That's, 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 <laughs> no, no worries. No worries, mate. <laughs> Your privacy is not in danger, but... Uh, it's, the, that's a great little book because it's, it's, it's like we have our... We said we would have some afternoon uh, experiential sessions and you went through Healing Touch, you went through Trust Walk, uh, and so when you read that little book, The Peace of God is My One Goal, it's based on the, the workbook lesson, The Peace of God is My One Goal, or it's actually a, a phrase that's used in the Course and it goes on, the aim of all my living here, the end I seek. But what you start to see is that all events, encounters, and circumstances are just used to build your faith and trust. So with some of those things, like Barbara was, you know, they would get up early in the morning and read the Lamsa Bible and the Bible and do the Course and Course lessons, you know, getting up the wee hours in the morning, very dedicated and devoted to just practicing. And that's your track, you're kind of on a fast track of, you know, okay, I'm new to this, but yeah, this resonates, so I'm, I'm going to go for it. And and that particular scene where that man was drunk and then uh, he was kind of outside the course group and then started talking to her when she came out, kind of as a drunk man could seem to be pestering and everything. And then of course the fear coming up with her because, because with the ego there is a sense of danger. And the ego would never let on that it, believing it, it is the dangerous thing. It, it, it projected a whole world, a sneaky world of false effects to make the danger seem to be to the human being. So there's a woman coming out of a course group and then getting ready to, to go home and then this encounter unfolds. And um, basically it goes into her, her simply just practicing her lesson of the day. All that I give is given to myself. And then when the fear comes up and the defensiveness comes up and just wanting to run away, get away, get safe, get away from the danger, her lesson is all that I give is given to myself. So it does seem to continue where she gets a number of opportunities to really practice the lesson of the day, experientially. Not just like, oh, did you, oh, I did my lesson of the day in the morning. What, what is it? I forget. You know, <laughs> you know, but this was like, it's coming back to her experientially to face. And, and I find that that's exactly how the workbook works. I actually had a Raising the Dead experience when I was doing uh, the workbook lesson, There Is No Death, The Son of God Is Free. That's the time to have a, a near, a, more, it wasn't a near-death experience, it was a Raising the Dead experience. 
But my lesson of the day, I, I did my lesson of the day, there, there is no death, the Son of God is free. It stayed in my mind, it lingered. I, I felt it whirling around in my heart very joyfully, like a tumbler. There is no death, the Son of God is free. Jesus was like, it's good news. There is no death, <laughs> the Son of God is free. And then going to a grocery store and I was going to go pick up a salad, make a salad bar, salad for my grandmother, but then I used to go to this one grocery store and Jesus said, no, go to this other one instead on the way. And I said, okay. Went to that one, saw a woman on the grocery store floor that was just laying there. The paramedics were trying to revive her. Then, then they left and there was just a, a dead body with no movement on the on the floor of the grocery store. And so I just kind of was I was back I was by the frozen foods putting my hand on the or the frozen foods and then there is no death. The Son of God is free. Energy energy Whew. watch the breath come back. Uh, the diaphragm of the lady started moving again with this like a Rolodex of energy. There is no death, the Son of God is free. It was, a, it was a perceptual experience of the lesson, which Jesus resurrecting from the dead and, and showing up to Mary Magdala. Perceptual reflection of the lesson that he was teaching. God loves you, there is no death. And Mary Magdala uh, comes in, they're all, oops, apostles are all locked in the upper room. Let me in, let me in. I've seen him. Who? Jesus, the Lord. Oh, they didn't believe her. I was like, that's too much. You're taking this too far. And why would he appear to a woman instead of the rest of us? You see, you can only imagine she, she took a lot of uh, sexism <laughs> with that one. I have seen him. I have seen the Lord. Eyebrows go up. <laughs> yes, like, because, because it was just beyond belief. Even in the perceptual realm, like, what? And, but, but when you start doing these lessons, like Barbara Varley was doing, she was very sincere, very sincere at wanting to experience the actual realization of the lesson. Because Jesus says all you have to do is experience it with one lesson, not cumulatively, just experience it with one lesson and you're, you graduate. So basically she was going through her day and going to that course group, and that was her lesson of the day. All that I give is given to myself. And so she would have thoughts like, if I, if I withhold something from this man, uh, then I'm teaching withholding. If I reject this man, then I'm teaching rejection. All that I give is given to myself. And she was sincerely wanting to experience safety, love, security, happiness and and practicing her lesson like almost just saying Jesus help me here guide me through this it seems extreme from a timeline perspective and I know I've had different people react to that and say right 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 the Holy Spirit would would guide her to say and do those things I'm like, a little child shall lead them. By your faith you shall see. You know, there are people that reject the, the parable even. They say, that's, she could have been raped or this or this. And I'm like, could have, would have, should have. Uh, uh, what's the lesson underneath? It's a lesson in trust in mind. It's a les lesson in follow the Holy Spirit. And it's a lesson in you will grow stronger in faith through practicing these lessons. That's all that Jesus is saying. He's not saying your world will look this way or that way, because it's an unreal world. Why would he try to promise <laughs> certain effects when he's trying to teach us that the ego is an unreal cause and the world's an unreal effect? And God is a real cause, and Christ is a real effect. That's his core teaching. He's, he's really bringing it home. You are love. You are created by love. You will forever be love. You are an eternal being. You will live forever and then regardless of the appearances, you still live forever. Whatever. The world turns into Shangri-La with 
flying angels around or the world turns into nuclear destruction. Jesus is not caring about that. He's not interested in world peace. He's interested in eternal life <laughs> because he is eternal life. So he's got a message of eternal life. He's not interested in the effects of illusions. And, and that's why probably the, the hardest thing for, for everyone is when they start to read a theology that says God didn't create the world. It started, wait a minute, that violates Genesis. That violates Genesis in the Bible. Yeah, Jesus is like, I'm here to teach eternal life. I don't care what I seem to violate. That violates the Bible. Well, actually, the Christ love presence is, and God, the real God of eternal love is what it's always been about. Not about books, not about theologies. You know, we're not here to base our, our life on, on a book, <laughs> even the Course. He says in Lesson 189, forget this world, forget this Course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. He's not even thinking the Course is special. Forget the Course, people are like, wait a minute, You're, I've just started. <laughs> but, it's, but the Varley book is, a, is kind of a, a pretty strong step into practical application. It's, it's, a, it's a good parable of practical application. So I, can, I think it's great that you asked about that, because that's, that's good. You didn't bring the mood down at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what, what was coming to me is, like Barbara Vali, they had been deeply practicing this for a long time. Their trust in the Spirit was, was very solid. And like Jesus says in the Course, you won't... I'm paraphrasing, you won't be given more than you can handle. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> but while you're afraid of losing privacy, for example, or losing a private mind and opening it up to the Holy Spirit and saying, I invite you in everywhere, <laughs> what you can do is say, I would really like it to be fun. Can you show me the lesson this day? And I want to have my eyes open and my heart open to you rearranging time and space or sh using my day, using the world to show me my lesson in a fun way that I can recognize. It's like saying that, yeah, it's the unworthiness. It's like, why would he why would take his time? Oh, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> because you're the beloved child of God. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. So beautiful. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> you're saving time for everyone. That's a question I hear a lot is like, but... Why me? Why would he care about me when he's so busy? <laughs> he's so busy with all the other 7.9 billion souls. Well, if there were 7.9 billion souls, then you could make a case for busyness, but one is the only number that you'll ever know. <laughs> Two is just a sad story. It still comes back to the I am presence and the number one. You know, the, the one, the oneness idea, you know, that's, and you don't even have to get into all the philosophical speculations, you know, because there's, how many versions of the Course are there? There's like four or five versions and, and are there separate souls or is there one soul or are there separate sons of God, and how many sons of God are there, and all this kind of uh, gibberish. You know, it's like, it's like Jesus is like, come into the experience, and then watch the questions disappear. You know, the questions are meant to evaporate. The ego asks the first question, ha ha. God doesn't ask questions, Christ doesn't ask questions. The ego asked the first question, and it was, what am I? Oh, okay, there's a dark night. There's a dark night 
Sounds like a Batman movie. That's a Dark Knight question. What am I? Yeah. Because that question is, is a denial of the truth. Because God doesn't ask that question, and Christ doesn't ask that question, and they're the fact. They're the fact of the matter, so it must be, it must be a foolish detour, attempted detour into nothing. You know, that's really what, what that would be. And yet, that question seems to be answered by everybody. You know, now it's like there's you know, Instagram accounts and Tumblers and Twitters, and now it's turned to X. What's your X account? You know, imagine we would live in the day when people would say, do you have an X account? <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's just false identity. That's what fear is, false evidence appearing real. That's the acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. And then to come deeper into that, just to see the false as false, then you can have a happy life. Uh, because you're not so concerned about the form that, that things will take, you know. That song on top of the world that I was singing at the beginning, you know, that's, that's your song. Not a cloud in the sky, got the sun in my eye, and I won't be surprised if it's a dream. Wow, that's a happy song. No wonder you're on top of the world <laughs> with that song. Yeah, but so that's the beauty of it. You're, the Beloved is just calling on the remembrance of the Beloved. Yeah, that's it. I didn't really know this was a question that I had, but I'm like, oh, yeah, I really feel it in this moment. I've heard you mention a few times about angels, and you told us before one of your friends like downloaded songs from the angels, and I'm just wondering what that symbol represents for you, like what, when you're speaking of angels, like what are you referring to? Yep, well, there's, there's a line in the Course, and there's actually an Amanishanti song that has it in the lyrics, angels are thoughts from God that come to you. So, the ego made the world of form, and then the Holy Spirit can use everything the ego made for the remembrance of the truth. So, angels are like, at times, um, at times if they seem to, they don't always have to have wings, big fluffy white wings, but they can be anywhere in your life when, when you find someone that seems to be so kind and so loving and helpful, and we go, wow, how was that experience? They were like an angel. That's uh, a per perceptual representation. And then, if you kind of go more into, if it's thoughts of God, it's more like a vibration or a frequency. So if you took the angelic form away and the wings away, and you could feel like a vibration, um, like a very sweet, heavenly vibration, like a song, like the, you know, the Buddha, apparently, when he was Siddhartha, he left the, uh, he left the palace where he was to be the king because he followed a song. And Jesus talks about the forgotten song that's so lovely and so beautiful that you would weep if you heard it. So you could start to think of angels kind of like a, a vibration or a frequency of light that basically has a very much of a helper function. Because the Holy Spirit is the comforter. You know, when Jesus said, when I go away, I will send the comforter to you. And that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's always been there, ever since the belief in separation, the, the answer was there. So the Holy Spirit's always been there, but, but with Jesus we really can start to feel that comforter. We, we see it speaking through Jesus, and loving through Jesus, and smiling through Jesus, and laughing through that form called Jesus. So, yeah, I would just say angels are, are like helpers. So, when my friend Resta just tuned in, and she would start <coughs> receiving these songs, very pr playful, and funny, and deep, and profound, I think there was probably around she got like around 270 songs, 
And so I said, wow, that's a whole, that's a whole pathway to God. Somebody who just listened to rest his music for the rest of their life, you know, would get these angelic, angelic downloads of just, imagine going through your day, oh, I listened to 42 angelic songs today, and I'm just dancing around like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers around the house, because, you know, that's a pathway to God. But, but the angels themselves are just helpers, reflections of, of the Holy Spirit's love. And uh, are they separate beings? There are no separate beings. Uh, that's, that's what they're here to draw the mind back into its oneness, to its divinity, you know. Uh, they say, you know, there's a one part uh, where it said, you were created above the angels. It just means that you, Christ, are the beloved of God. You are a perfect spirit. And so, in that sense, you are above the angels, because the angels are just symbols of that love. They're just part of that bridge back to the remembrance of, of the Christ. That everyone's the Christ. Uh, they just have to recognize it. They just have to come back into the, I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was, I am, into that actual experience. And the angels are, are, are beautiful symbols along the way. I mean, a lot of us know that. But some of us have had pets that we swear <laughs> were angels. You've been telling some of the tripod stories. There was one time you were up in the, up in the peace house, in the, that room in there, and you were not feeling well. And the door closed, but it never really closed like a regular door, because it, it always, you could just push it somewhat closed, and, and then tripod, our three-legged cat, came up to provide nurturing love to you, and she only had three legs, so she somersaulted. She <laughs> somersaulted and flipped with her legs like a rat, and, and kicked, knocked the door down, <laughs> pushed the door open, because Kirsten was all in there needing help and nurturing, and the little three-legged cat did a, a flip and poof, Knocked the door open and came in and then came in for a snuggle. <laughs> like, I am here. <laughs> yeah, you're like barreling into the room. <laughs> you called? <laughs> you need me? Bounce, bounce, bounce. <laughs> right on top of my chest. <laughs> and that, that was for us very much uh, of an angelic presence. Tripod's sister had four legs, <laughs> and her name was Angel. And Angel would some come, come up to her sister, Tripod was angry, and she would just get her paws and claws. And Tripod just had one paw, so that kept her standing up. And then Angel would go boom, boom, boom on the face, because <laughs> she, had, she, had, she had no paws. <laughs> She was using the only one to stay up, <laughs> and the other, well, the other one was like a little nub, <laughs> and so her sister was like, boom, 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 <laughs> and we would watch, <laughs> and then we would see him like five minutes later, Angel racing with tripod in full pursuit, <laughs> like, uh, sister, you're paying for that, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's like, Muhammad Ali going into a boxing match with one <laughs> arm with George Foreman. Just <laughs> 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 you know, that was, but there was a time too when we had this TV set in the Peace House in the Sanctuary and it was when The Matrix came out. Remember the first Matrix movie? And we were watching the, the first time we watched The Matrix movie on the TV and there's that scene Toward the beginning, when these agents, these police officers come in to, to capture Trinity, and Trinity just goes up in the air in like stop action, slow motion. While this is happening, the cats come in and they both, angel, uh, tripods there, angels like ready to attack and comes out and both of them go up like this. <laughs> Our, Right during the scene with Trinity, and we, we were like, we, were, we could not watch it. We, we, our eyes were drawn away because the cats were, they were like three, three and a half feet in the air like this. They were, they were saying, we can do it better. 
uh, then the Wachowski brothers and Trinity, you know, watch us. Let's see, we do the same scene. And we were just like, we did move our eyes away from the matrix. We, we had our own matrix going on, but, but that was our angels. Yeah, those were, angel and tripod were, were part of our, and, and you know, a lot of you have had pets like that, that are so there for you, so helpful, so loving, so nurturing. That's, that fits the uh, definition of an angel too. Don't have to have big wings and stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, I have like, maybe it would be considered a procedural question. Um, there seems to be a thought experience, um, how do I describe this? Like a part of the mind that's like <coughs> helpful-ish, um, but sees like the healing as like a project. So it's a little on the timeline. And so the thoughts come in and it would be something like, um, oh, right use of judgment, how do you feel? Oh, okay, how do I feel? Um, and then like sort of direct, it, like, and I'm just wondering, you know, is that like sort of an egoic aspect? Is that like, decision maker because it seems to be you know on my behalf to some degree but it also has I can feel that the way it's holding experience uh, is like has is on the timeline it's like there's a project the project of awakening or the project of uh, oh in this moment there is belief in separation like there's just like a problem. It's subtle. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So what do you, so what is that part of the mind? Like, is it like the spiritual ego? Like, what is it? Like, is it valuable to label it? And if I notice it coming up, like, do, is there a suggestion for working with it? Like, I'm just a being aware I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure what I'm asking, but I'm just curious about this, like, this function of mind that feels like it's kind of on my side, but maybe, is it on my side? I'm not, you know what I'm talking about? That, yeah, that's yeah. What, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, Andrea, it's like, it's like, if the timeline is seen, we'll, we'll say as the baseline, that linear time is seen as life, you know, and not as a movie or not as just a dream, then, then Jesus is, and the Holy Spirit are so practical, they will reach the mind with what it believes. You know, you know it would be like being told you are the Christ and it going over your head. I'm like, hmm, sentimentally, I'm with you on that. You know, practically, hmm, I don't know, I doubt it. But you see, if it if it if it's so high, it would go completely over your head. Actually, how helpful is it if it if you, if it goes over your head and you you can't relate to it? I mean, how helpful would guidance be to us if we couldn't relate to it? If we were told something and we said, "What?" <coughs> or we were given an instruction, "What?" You know, if if we cannot relate to it, then it's not practical. So you're describing like a timeline scene, a little nudge or a little call, or you can call it a project. You could call human relationships as, well let's just call them assignments. You know, just like when you're in school and you have assignments to complete for your coursework and your degree and everything, you know, you, you have to take the assignments. The assignments are given and then you have to take them on, really, usually pretty full on. You can't just blow the assignment off and go, eh, maybe. You know, you, if you say that to the instructor, the instructor's like, do you want to be in this class? <laughs> you know, if you're in the class, then you have the assignments. The class is the mind, so it's always really assignments in the mind. But, 
But if you're not in touch with the mind fully, the power of the mind and the fullness of the mind, then, then you have to relate to it as, as the character and the timeline. So those are like projects or assignments. You know, even when we say here, when the question comes up, will there be any function in the afternoon, the function is somewhat associated with we'll say a collaborative project for the good of training my mind for the whole. Actually, if you go deeper with that, you start to realize that, that if you go really back into that function, that you go so deep back, it goes away from weeding or cleaning or all the things that are in form, it goes so far back to forgiveness. See the false is false. Whew. That's my function, Jesus is like, yeah, that's your function. That's really your function, is to see the false as false. But if you're not ready to see the false as false, then the Holy Spirit has to give you something practically that you can relate to. Okay, I can sweep the deck. I want to do it with joy. <laughs> I, I would love to be joyfully about whatever I'm doing. Do it through me. Sweep the deck through me. Have some fun today, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Do whatever, but, you know, it's like Khalil Gibran and the Prophet, you know, whatever you, when you work, work with joy, work with love, he basically says in the Prophet. And so, just think about that in terms of human relationships. If you started to seem to have a, a human relationship and you started to think of it as an assignment, then you could say, wow, there's a much greater purpose for this human relationship than the egoic things. Get my needs met, survival, security, you know, companionship, all egoic. You know, even companionship, you know, the Christ doesn't need a companion because there's only one. <laughs> Christ, are you missing a companion? What's that? You know, <laughs> I am. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, <laughs> so much for companionship. <laughs> so you see how deep it goes, but you can start to see it as the assignment, and then you take it to heart. Like you really want to give your heart to that temporary project or that temporary assignment. Like we did when we showed that, uh, that uh, Black Mirror episode, Ascension Through Relationships. It started out very, very interpersonal, and then in the end, whoosh, all the anomalies were, whoop, were getting, they were all ascending at the end, by the end of that. Talk about an ending to an episode. We did edit it a little bit, right? JC, <laughs> JC knows how we, we took the edited version, but that was taking us more towards the light, towards the abstraction. So. Is there anything egoic in, in assignments and projects? Yeah, the form was made by the ego. And then the Holy Spirit is using what the ego made to loosen the mind from the identification with the form. So that's why we talk about instead of being the doer, which we had a lot of stress and guilt over, <laughs> did I do enough? Could I have done more? You know, there's a lot of guilt. The ego plays that card all the time. But to be done through is more like you say, okay, Holy Spirit, have some fun with the puppet today. I'm, I'm going to watch you have fun with the puppet. Speak through me, laugh through me, smile through me, hug through me. While I believe I'm a puppet, I give the puppet over to you for the glory of God, for, to bring a blessing to the whole universe. And then, whatever you seem to do is, it doesn't, you don't feel like a weight with it, because you're being done through, you know. My friend Resta, uh, one of her prayers, she loved the puppet analogy, the marionette, the puppet analogy, and her prayer to Jesus and the Holy Spirit was, put me back on the strings. Put me back on the strings. You see how different that is from autonomy. I. I did it. I can do that. I can handle anything. I, 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 I. Small I. Her prayer was, 
put me back on the strings. Sing through me, smile through me, laugh through me. That's a good use of, of relationship assignments, that's a good use of projects. Um, I remember when we were traveling around a lot, Rest and I, sometimes she would say, the ego is like, it's got this flagpole and it's got this flag and it keeps raising the flag up on the top of the flagpole just to see if I'll salute. So she got used to practicing watching the ego raising the red flag, raising the flag up and just going, no, not gonna, I'm not saluting. <laughs> you can raise as many red flags as you want, I'm not saluting. I'm not going to give in that there's a problem here. I'm not going to give in that there's something I have to handle in form when really the problem is in my mind. I'm just not going to salute anymore. So we have many, 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 many parables of being done through and like Kirsten was just sharing about, you know, learning to play the guitar, singing, coming a song coming through, singing the song for yourself for the healing, then learning the guitar, then recording an album, and then singing on a stage, and then a world tour. You know, it just was like, boop, 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 boop. it just kept requiring more surrender, more like, I give it over. This is, this is not a personal thing here. This is for expansiveness. This is for opening to vastness. And yet, the, you say, is this ego or not? Well, the form, is is always made by the ego. The ego made the cosmos, so obviously <laughs> it made the form, it made all the bodies, it made everything. But the Holy Spirit can use it all to bring us back to the moment. Starting to see things more simultaneous than linear, you know, just momentary. Start to, the old thing was how many angels can fit on the head of a pin? Jesus can put the whole cosmos onto the head of a pin. That's a, that's a, that's a reverse of the Big Bang. <laughs> he can shrink the whole cosmos. Oh, it's on that pin over there. What? <laughs> the scientists are like, <laughs> what about the Hubble telescope? The whole, the whole thing is on, on the head of a pin. Only an instant does this world endure. That's one of his workbook lessons. He shrinks, he shrinks the whole cosmos down and says, only an instant does this world endure. And that's just his stepping stone to eternity. Go past that instant. Don't let that instant stop you from, from God. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was just one miracle after another uh, from you, David, thank you, and Kirsten. I think um, what's finally coming to me is I'm finally touching the holy ground and feel it safe uh, because I finally realized I can trust my brother. Why? Because they were my angels. They were all my angels. Yeah, my biological father appeared like a big dog angel attacking me, but I was ready for that. It was fierce grace. It was fierce grace and I was ready. I always played small and thought I wasn't ready, but Jesus is helping me understand that I was ready. I remember when Kenneth was visiting me in England, I was writing a text in English and suddenly it turned into Arabic and the whole message was already written, forgive your father for I'm the one who sent him. And uh, I'm just completing my understanding of that now. My father was my biggest angel, my mother was an angel, 
and my brother, who is an angel. And I'm also feeling like the Alpha and the Omega coming together. <laughs> this is on the left because everything's happening here, seemingly physiologically. Um, right at the start of my journey, I had a, a meditation and the body disappeared. And when you said God could be an arm and a hand, I understand now. I saw that arm and the hand on the ceiling and I understood that God is saying, help me. I didn't understand it. How can I help God? Help, I mean, yeah, my healing is the help. My accepting my healing and accepting its enormity and accepting that I am ready and I'm accepting the constructive aspect of the dream because I've been stuck in the negative projection for so long and I'm afraid to talk about the the positive, the constructive aspect of the dream, you know, my readiness to heal such a massive nuclear event. It always appeared as a nuclear event in my mind. And I also went deeper into the meditation and so just shimmering light. I, I knew that I was like my mother and I was terrified of looking at the light and spirit again put an arm and said to me, look, 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 until I looked. I was still afraid, and I'm still afraid now, but it's not that terror. It's I, I, I realize it's just fear of speaking my truth. And I think that's what Jesus will use my skills for, to speak the truth as I experienced it. Maybe a book, maybe something like that. But I'm still missing the fun, and the joy which this retreat brought me. So I'm still missing just connecting with my brothers and playing. <laughs> the rape memory was like I was playing, 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 and then I was sent into a room where there was rape. So I forgot the play, and I was crying all this time on the timeline, you know, crying for this character. So now I understand the release I always had this image of myself at the top of the slide, holding on tight. And Jesus said, just release the self-image. It's You're not releasing a body. You're not releasing, you're not a body. You're not releasing a body. Release the self-image. And so, yeah, I think that's what's over. Just the self-image just, just haunted me. And I wanted to get rid of myself believing I'm real, as a body, as a when it was only a self-image. So, yeah, yeah, I feel safe and good. I feel safety finally. Safety eluded me all my life. It's like literally, my feet were never on the ground. I was stuck in this whirlwind of ego thoughts, and there was like a lot of cold and freeze in 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 my feet because I I'm stuck in the projection, I, like the belief that I left heaven and I'm stuck in the projection. And I was, you know, just feeling the warmth in my feet and and the laughter is the cure for me <laughs> because I have to laugh at this creepy idea <laughs> that I left heaven. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's time for laughter and play. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Spoken like a graduate. <laughs> that was like a commencement speech. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's so beautiful. It's the, in the end, we can start to see that, that when we really have the power of interpretation, then actually fear can be interpreted as a call for love. And then when we start to get much better at interpreting calls for love, seeing all the calls for love, not missing a call for love, <laughs> extending love in response to a call for love, you can see it just, the whirlwind of those ego thoughts just has to fade away. It can't stay in that presence. It's kind of like be before even coming, seeming to come to earth, you know, it's almost like, you know, being in a room and with all these ones, okay, you're going to play this part, you'll play this part, thank you for playing this part, ooh, you get to play the villain 
part, the father part. I'm trusting you to act that out completely. I, I need, I need to release myself from, from all of this. So these are the parts. And then it's the underlying trust is I trust you spirit to use them in a way, use the parts in a way that will allow me to come back to home, to my true heart, to my true source, to my, to my empowerment in the mind, to, to be able to, to laugh. There was a time when we were watching a lot of movies, but there was like movie after movie after movie where the where they were all kind of applauding, all the characters. Woody Allen had a movie and I watched the whole movie and then in the end all the characters just applauded. And Woody Allen was like looking around as all the characters in the movie just applauded. And then I saw another movie where everybody was applauding or cheering and then another one and then another one. And that that's really what's coming into your mind now, you know, is like, I'm ready to play. My playmates, <laughs> I play and laugh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for that. I'm ready for that. Because that's the experience of the lightness, the lightheartedness, not that heaviness and defensiveness. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you, that's so beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Maria. It seems like I left heaven to find a world of satisfaction. I didn't find satisfaction and that should have been the end of the story. I feel like I, I should have walked out from here after that realization. But it came to my mind that is there will be denying what what is in my mind, what is seemingly feeling here in the in, in this made up world. And that cannot be like a spiritual bypassing, because you have said um, we come in this world with our little backpack already, and then and the programming happens along the way. Um, I was uh, doing the levels of mind yesterday with Rose, and it seems like a, I come to like a, there is like entanglement in the mind. There is so many little. Um, peculiarities and in, intricacies of this of this um, persona I made up that are always playing with me. And uh, we got to the point where um, where we spoke about not denying the body, not denying what is going on here. And I'm, I, I question like what really that means not denying this cosmos, these made up stories. And what has been happening is I've been waking up in the mornings and around four and I, I see this timeline timeline of my life. It's like a long string and I'm asking Jesus what I am seeing these past images I, f I feel like I have released them, like I'm, you know, in the last past year I've been, sh been shown a lot, and I feel like I, I, I have come to terms with all that, but then the next day again, and I'm, I'm asking, is the ego showing me this to torture me, or is Jesus wants to, is showing it to me for I can see something, and you know, it kept coming for the last four nights, but this morning again, and and what I um, and what it showed me was, uh, you've been speaking about the fear of miscreation. <clears throat> so what I saw in the timeline was a time in my life when I had this high intuition in my thirties, forties, 
And I could sometimes even read people's thoughts. And I also could pick up um, <coughs> feelings and emotions. And, and I, I, I live my life with that for a long time, and I, and I use it for um, my advantage, like, um, like I, I should not relate to this person because it's thinking this and this. Or, and I kind of isolate myself. And, um, and then I was relating a lot to people through like the false empathy where, um, where I, I, I felt the pain and I, uh, other people's pains and uh, even in the world. Um, and so, you know, when I was going through these images of the past, um, I felt that that was miscreation, like, I remember um, when, you know, like when I came to the U.S. in the late 80s, and I was hearing these songs of the 60s, and you know, I started learning about this, the 60s and MLK and all this. Um, I feel when I hear that music, I mean, it just kills me. It brings a lot of sadness, like I, I, I was there in the 60s, in the 60s, I was a little child in Colombia. And I feel like I was there. And I, I, even today, I cannot hear that music because I, I, I feel like I'm, like a lot of sadness, like a lot of pain. And um, even when I was reading in college, I went to college in the mid-30s, I was reading this, this transatlantic journey from the slaves from Africa to, to the U.S. I remember reading that book like in six or seven hours, but in tears. And in suffering and in empathizing through the pain that these people seemingly <laughs> suffer. And, um, and just like that, they showed me in the timeline and, uh, and you know, at some point in my life, I kind of didn't want that, and I kind it kind of faded away. And I was like, something happened, like, oh, I'm in fear of miscreation because I couldn't relate. When you've been talking this week about it, I can I I can relate to certain things. You know, if something is not out from the subconscious into our awareness, then we can't relate to it. So that was um, a good realization. Like, I cannot explain it, but I can, like, in my mind, it play out what is miscreation and the fear of miscreating. And, um, and I, I still have some of that where I empathize. Like, uh, one day I was picking up, like, a lot of grief in the group here. And I, I told the spirit, I don't want that, I don't want that, and I don't want to feel these things. And I don't know, I don't know what to do with that, I don't know what it is. But I feel like uh, those things have been released, but it's been showing me again. So, forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is what the Course talks about, is the illusion that that and breathe more illusions. So I forgive all these things. I, you know, sometimes I feel like it's so, like, so easy, like, you know, forgiving. And, I, and, I, and I've been in that space of fearless, of I'm bold, I, I'm here as spirit, and I, I feel like in the last year, it's just been like more with the ego. We're showing this, all these things. Um, a lot of them I didn't know, and that's, I, I guess that's a good thing. Um, yeah, because I, I mean, I had a, a, a um, grievance with my, my father, and I, I didn't, it wasn't into awareness. 
And um, yeah, doing the minds or labels, I feel like it's, there is a, it's entanglement in the mind. Like in the, I still have that thing where I, I have feelings seemingly from the outside, from places. I sometimes get attached to things so it's so quickly. You know, like like a, my pets or unless I want to, you know, live my life loving in a way that is not is not attached. That is free. That I can, whatever happens, it's okay. That I'm not feeling, losing anything. And so when I, I do forgiveness work, um, I feel like um, something has to, I have to feel something. Something must happen in me, a feeling or, or a, a realization. And, and so there is a lesson. Show me forgiveness as it is. And I, I pray that many, many times to Jesus. And, I release this, I forgive this, um, but I feel like a, the, a, lot of, a lot of times things come back because actually if they come back, they're not released. They're not, they're still in my, in my field, so. Um, and I feel sometimes like a, in my mind, things just kind of like, I get like an upgrade, like a, something that I cannot explain, like some realization, some things happen there. And uh, I, I've been enjoying the retreat, you know, feeling the love of the everybody you know, I feel like uh, Jesus is here in everybody's mind, just like he was 2,000 some years here and seemingly here in this earth. And, uh, and that I feel like um, we are all the disciples and we are collaborating with that purpose to help to awaken seemingly many minds. And so, I don't know what uh, what you can say to me about what I just said, and I, I yeah, because I feel like with, with Rose, I mean, I, you know, I when we did it yesterday two times in the levels of mine, and I, um, I kind of get to like a like a, a wall, but. Um, it's been very helpful because I am feeling like uh, my, my, uh, that I, I can accept, I can start accepting more, more uh, or have more willingness to, to be open and not to be so much on the uh, defense, not making up defenses to to avoid things. So, yeah, I, I think sometimes that maybe, I mean, I, sometimes I feel I don't, I'm not afraid of losing this pile of bones, but maybe underneath there is the fear of losing the body. You know, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Or losing other bodies that, seem that, that are not there. Yeah, thank you. We can go deeper into to what you've just shared. Yeah, that it's true that that the denial of the body is the inappropriate use of denial. Uh, the mind, with in conjunction with the ego, the power of the mind in conjunction with the ego belief made the body. But to deny the body ultimately is inappropriate because it's you fall into the trap of 
denying the power of the mind. It's to almost, to deny the body is to try to negate an aspect of what the body is. It was made as a projection of the mind. And, and when the mind tries to just get into denial of the body, then it's basically missing the point that the body is a projection, part of everything else, the stars, the planets, and everything, and to deny the body is like to deny the, the power of the mind, and that's never helpful. So, so denying the body is the inappropriate use of denial. What is the appropriate use of denial? Is to deny the belief that error can hurt you. Deny the belief in the mind that the error can hurt you. So it sounds like you go from times of true empathy, where you're just feeling the love and the connection, and, and the peace. That's true empathy, coming back into alignment with the Holy Spirit. And, and how would the body look in true empathy? Jesus says, he tells us, he says, the body's eyes will continue to report differences. But the healed mind puts them into one category. They are unreal. He's very specifically telling us, the body's eyes will continue to report differences, but the healed mind will put them into one category. They are unreal. You see, that's where we come into true empathy. False empathy, like you mentioned when you had a period in your life where these psychic abilities, you were both an empath and telepathic. You were picking up feelings. You were picking up thoughts. They asked Jesus, are psychic powers desirable? Hmm. If they're given to the Holy Spirit, they're helpful. If, they're, if the ego uses them for its purposes, they're not helpful. You see how even with psychic abilities, it's the purpose. The purpose is the most important thing. Am I giving these psychic abilities over to the Holy Spirit and Jesus and say, if it helps, use them. <laughs> if, if, they, if they help bring me to true empathy and forgiveness, then please use them. Use them fully. So, it's beautiful because you start to realize that, that the reason it seems to be kind of a sticky point or it, it still seems to at times feel like stuck or messy at times when you're going through levels of mind or going through this. It's, it always comes back to the willingness to open up to true empathy because Jesus says, out of all the concepts I'm going to teach you, the one that is one of the most difficult ones to grasp is true empathy. So he's telling us right up front. He said, don't be down on yourself. This, is, this will seem to be a difficult thing to, to grasp, to, to really fully take in. True empathy means to stay with what's real and true. What did he say in the introduction? Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. Okay, the bar is set. <laughs> that's the, if, that's the if that's the summary at the bottom of the introduction of the entire course, then that right there is a call into true empathy. And that means that we have to let up everything from the unconscious mind that would deny that true empathy. We're dealing with a mind thing here. We, we don't need to get focused on the body. Um, even if you look at Jesus, you know, he seemed to go through the early years, you know, the, the Bethlehem manger and then the early years and then we follow along his little life and the family goes, you know, to Jerusalem and he, he's not interested in sightseeing. He's in the temple with the rabbis at 12 years old. He's not, they're ready to go on a sightseeing tour of, of Jerusalem and he's like, where's Jesus? He's having deep discussions 
with the rabbis that are much older than him. And then when the family leaves, you know, they don't, they don't even look for him. It doesn't, they're on the way back to Nazareth. Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Oh, we left him. We left him. <laughs> Nobody knows where he is. They have to go all the way back, look around, go searching, searching around in Jerusalem. Finally they find him. He's still in deep discussion. <laughs> where were you? Don't you know the family was leaving? leaving? What are you doing here? We we're halfway back to Nazareth and you know, we had to come back to get you and 12 years old. Don't you know I have to be about my father's business? Yeah, try to tell that to your mom and dad when you're 12 years old. <laughs> There's something going on inside there <laughs> that is tuned into reality. Don't you know I have to be about my father's business at 12 years old? Then, you know, that's, that's a different perspective. And that's exactly what he's calling on us to do is, is to have a change in the perspective in which we see the world or a change in our interpretation of the world. So when you look, I, I think it was great that you were even in touch with this thing about the 60s music. You know, you come in the late 80s, you start to hear this 60s music, and there, maybe there was a part in you that was feeling, wow, it's like freedom. And, Janis Joplin, <laughs> oh, the Beatles, oh. <laughs> you know, you start to feel these, these, the Beach Boys. Gotta keep those love and good vibrations happening with her. You're not the only one <laughs> who felt the music of the 60s. You're not the only one because it's felt. There's an expansiveness. But maybe the sadness is more of, oh my gosh, I was just a child in, in Colombia. I missed out. We have, sometimes we get that missed out feeling. Like, ah! Why was I born when I was born? Because I would have loved to. But we always, it's always our mind, so we can rediscover it, you know. I remember in the parable of David, I was living, you know, as a child in, in grade school, you know, in the suburbs of, of Cincinnati. And this is what a lot of people have come to call being a wasp. I was a wasp child. White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. <laughs> little wasp David out in his little suburbs, you know, and, and then if there was like, you know, 1968 riots in Chicago or something on, my parents would, let's change that channel there, protect your little wasp body there. Don't get too many, don't show too much conflict and struggle. The 60s are going on, and John Lennon, and the Beatles, and all, pro, war protests, Yoko Ono, and change the channel. Oh, it's Lawrence Welk. You know. And maybe you've started to, you immigrate to the United States, maybe you start to feel like a sadness when you hear that music. Something inside you relates to it so deeply. And maybe there's a conclusion in the mind like, ah, I missed out. I should have met Janis Joplin. <laughs> I, should have, I should have been there talking to those. Sometimes people feel that when they watch Jesus' revolution. They start to feel that same feeling like, wow, there's some excitement going on there. Some, some real Jesus energy going on there. So, but even that, it's just a judgment in the mind. You know, it's just a, a self-judgment. It's just, things could have been better if they were different, or I wish I'd had a different script, or I wish I'd been born at a different time, or all those kind of things. That's, those are all hypothetical just judgments of the ego squirming. Squirming, squirming. Oh, I'd been much happier if this was different, if this was different, if you know, if I was born at a different time, and all this and that. Just more squirming. Ego is not content. It, it can't be. It's a death wish. How could we expect a death wish to be content? You know, it's, it's a shaky 
faulty perception of reality as what it is. So we have to slowly keep giving our heart over. I give you my heart. I give you my heart. I give you my heart day after day. I trust you. I'll follow you. Where you lead, I will follow you. Follow you. I will step back and let you lead the way. Your devotional life. You have a, such a devotional life. And the ego is going to try to sidetrack that devotion. You know, oh, oh, well, what about this? Oh, look at this. And what about this? And even with psychic abilities, well, you know, the ego will say, aha, you misuse them. You know, it will always try to put us down. It's always going to try to derail our, our awakening. It's a death wish. What else could it do? It's terrified of the awakening. If, if I know who I am, then the ego's out of business. Talk about dependency. It needs the power of the mind, but we don't need it. We don't need that belief. That belief is not, a death wish is not supporting our remembering of who we are. We have to, we have to see it for what it is. So, so it's beautiful. I mean, really, like you were sharing earlier in the retreat, like even before you came, you, you really weren't feeling well. You weren't feeling well. You were feeling frail and, and people were saying your body's thin and, and you were feeling pain and everything. And yet you still came. You were like Truman, the Truman Show. You were feeling all these things and you were like, is that the best you can do? <laughs> you think you're stopping me? <laughs> and, you're, and then you came. And even when you weren't feeling well and you came and you expressed and you began to open up and, and I think that's the thing, is to start to, to be, start to feel grateful for your willingness, for your devotion. Like you shared, you know, deep down inside, I, I just know intuitively that love is real. I know that that's, that's calling me. I know deep, deep down, deeper than my body, deeper than the bones, deeper than anything, I know in my heart that, that this is all about the love and, and the ego is just trying to sidetrack that, that devotion. It's trying to just get your attention, it's trying to blink on the side of your mind. It's over here, over here, over here, Maria! Maria, Maria, Maria! It's trying to, <laughs> you know, it's just trying to get your attention. But, but that's the beautiful thing of this retreat is the, that your devotion to God is being reflected in your brothers and your sisters, yeah. And, and I feel like this is a time of celebration, like you're on your way. You really are really <coughs> on your way. You know, you're, you want to follow that devotion. You want to awaken. You want to experience fully that which you intuitively know is there, the love. You know, intuitively you do know it's there. But the messy part, the tricky part, is just the, the distraction, blinking on the side. You know, when we, we have to keep our attention on the prize. We have to really keep coming back to the moment and forgive ourselves, forgive what seemed to go wrong, forgive what we wish was different, forgive what we believed was better, that we missed out on, forgive all those those things and start to just slowly come into now. It all was a working for the together, together for my good. There are no mistakes in the plan. Just because the ego tried to misinterpret the the blessed things that were there, like like Muna was saying, all you know, you can see the forgiveness. Okay, this biological father was sent in as an angel to to help me remember who I am. That's a high interpretation when you go from what you did see before with the swirling mess of thoughts to, that was an angel. That was, that was for me. That was for my healing. That was for my awakening. That was not, you know, sent to sabotage my awakening. That was sent for my awakening. There are no mistakes in the plan. That's, that's, you can feel the, the empowerment behind that. You can feel the energy, like, wow, there was no mistakes. I just misinterpreted for a moment. I, I misinterpreted things and then 
Jesus said, I got you. I got you. Back up here. Pull us up from the bootstraps. Like, you're still great. You're still wonderful. You're still the Christ. Nothing you ever went through can take away your Christhood, your Christ essence. So thank you. Thank you for just pouring it all out. Sometimes that's the only way you can do it, just a stream of consciousness. Just just let it come out and then then let it let the mind quiet down, come back into the tranquility. Like, okay. And also the frustration sometimes is I is a willing wanting to understand, but but peace and understanding go together and cannot be found apart. So you, it's just a prayer. You're just praying for the, the peace of God that passeth the understanding of the world. Passeth the ego's understanding, which the ego has no understanding. <laughs> so we, of course we have to go past all attempts to figure it out, all attempts to understand the form, because that that's part of the defense against true understanding. You know, in one sense, I remember Eckhart Tolle one time said, he said, can you be comfortable with not knowing? You know, that's, that's an important thing, not knowing anything about this world. Can you be comfortable with saying to yourself, I don't understand this world. And then Jesus comes in and it's like, yeah, you, and never will. Never will. Oh, thank you. That's somehow that releases me right there. I will never understand the world. Well, it was made by a death wish. Do you think you can understand a death wish? Do you think you can understand the projection of a death wish? This world is backwards and upside down, Jesus says. He says that in the Course. The world is backwards and upside down. Do you think you can understand something that's backwards and upside down? Let it go, let it go, don't hold back anymore. <laughs> the past is in the past. Jesus is saying, do you really think you can understand the past? When God didn't create it? You think you'll find peace by analyzing the past or embracing the past? You know, that it's, it's good news. He's, it's so simple, but our mind, when we believed in the ego, we made up complexity. We made up extreme complexity. And then the truth is so, 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 so very simple that, that we have to humbly drop into it. We, we have to drop, almost like dropping into the light. We have to just, oh, I'm going to parachute into the light. Okay, I, no parachute, I'll just drop. <laughs> I'm coming right there. Catch me, Lord. <laughs> I've got no parachute today. Catch me. <laughs> I'm dropping into you. Yeah. That, that, there's no sense of doing or achieving or accomplishing. Drop. Drop into the love. Drop into it. Because of the worthiness, of the worthiness of a child of God to remember the Beloved, to remember the blessings, to remember the Creator, that's everything. Yeah. So thank you, Maria. We're all, we're all with you. And I was, I, you came here and I was so happy to see you. I was like <laughs> singing West Side Story songs. Maria, I just met a girl named Maria, and suddenly I felt, oh my gosh. You know, we have to come into the joy of that, like meeting for the first time, without a story, without a past, you know. We are glorious in this instant. <laughs> we are really glorious. We, we come without stories, without trying to rehash things, you know, whenever we're ready, Jesus says, you can stop rehashing what never happened. Uh, that might be a good uh, use of your mind. <laughs> Ever since I went to La Casa, that he's got it, and he's, he's doing it. 
he's guiding, he's taking care of everything is and doing it the perfect way because he knows this mind and um, maybe there is too much fear or I think it's perfect what is what is happening. Yeah, and I, I can be open to to in an instant let the cosmos disappear and just trust trust in every moment that I'm guided and it is perfect. Even even if I don't have that uh, consistent consistency in my life, I can I can bring it up and I can trust because if I am that I am that I'm nothing else. Yeah. I was made out of love and I am love. And I am the light. Yes, you are. And there is nothing else. There is nothing else. And that's it. That's it. And that's so beautiful because you're, you have this heart of devotion and, and that's what links you in with Jesus so deeply, your heart of devotion. And Andrea was bringing up the practical, like projects and assignments and everything. I mean, even if you step back and look at it from the, look at the timeline, you could say, well, okay, this Maria character has kind of been loosening and loosening and, and letting go of the past and loosening from control, responsibilities, obligations, duties, all those things. The ego's been throwing at you for years, trying to keep you pinned down. And now you're, you're loosened and loosened. And so even from like what Andrea was saying, the practical aspects of things, it's like, you know, you may be saying, here I am, Lord. I'm skin and bones, uh, not been feeling too well recently, uh, but here I am, I, I, whatever I can do to help, uh, help you in the plan, I'm here. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I have skills and abilities, but yeah, here they are, whatever they are, they're yours. And Jesus is like, oh, my bilingual Maria, <laughs> you've got just... <laughs> just the skills and abilities I've been waiting for and you can help so much. I'm not bilingual. Kirsten's not bilingual. Andy's not bilingual. <laughs> JC. Jeffrey's not bilingual. JC's. He can handle anything. <laughs> JC Central can handle anything, but not a lot of us, you know, are, are even, even bilingual. And then you show up and they, oh, there's Maria, my beloved child, my bilingual Maria. And so it's like a skill. You may not even think of it, but, for, but it's a great ability that can be used by Jesus in the plan. It's a very important ability. So you see, even from the practical perspective of giving yourself over and saying, use me, Lord, you know what's best, you know what will be, bring the biggest blessing to the whole universe, then that is no small thing. That is no small thing. You've just basically been praying and praying and freeing yourself up of lots of concepts and duty, duties, obligations, responsibilities, things. And that's the process. You start to loosen yourself from those so you can actually just come to, here I am, Lord, use me. And then the blessing radiates out. You think you like the movie, the music of the 60s. Jesus is going to play a symphony in you like you've never heard before. He'll show you some music. <laughs> but it comes when we surrender our skills and abilities, whatever 
the past was, we surrender and just say, use me, that's when we start to hear the symphony. That's when the music, all, imagine all the singers of the 60s just like a row of angels cheering you on, go for it, give those skills over, you know. Let them be used in a greater plan that, than any of us are aware of. A divine orchestration, we'll call it. There's a divine rearranging time and space for the glory of God, you know, bringing everything into perfect alignment with, with the will of God. That's important. That's, that's the symphony that, that we all want. And that's, that's really like answering the call for love, saying, yeah, I, okay. That's it. I, w I say yes, God. <laughs> That's all you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, we're going to move into our, our next phase after a break and yeah, just the value of staying linked in. You know, how do you avoid a dark night of the soul? We don't spend a whole night in it. We have an alternative direction for our mind. So just like you've experienced through this retreat, every time you come in this room, something happens. You can feel it. You're in the field of the Holy Spirit's purpose. We're in here for healing. We're in here for forgiveness. We're joined in the Holy Spirit's purpose. And then when you're involved in the collaborative projects that we call function, same thing. The purpose, it's the purpose that heals. There's an alternative for the mind. So then when the darkness comes up, you can let it come up and let it go and redirect your mind into the Holy Spirit's purpose. That is the Holy Spirit's purpose, bringing the darkness to the light. That's an alignment. But also to have something that serves his plan. Like you're saying, how can I help your plan? When you're helping, when you're serving, you're being lifted up out of the darkness into the light in your mind. So if I could just give any kind of testimony as to what supports the mind to heal, it's service. This is a, just a backdrop for being in my function of forgiveness in a way that lifts our mind into the light to eventually come into the symphony, <laughs> to come into really feeling that I am part of the symphony. I'm playing a note in the symphony. I'm part of it. I'm part of this healed mind. You know, I'm part of the healed mind through giving my mind over to it. So... Yeah, there's so many ways to link in with this and and stay in it. So beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So after the bathroom break, then yeah, the, some of those ways to stay linked in in a in a very easy or a direct way. That's you know many of you have already discovered a lot of them, but this is just more clarity on on what's yeah you know, ways. You can link in, so we're thrilled. You know, we we like to stay linked in to God, and this is just our our expression, our our life. Yeah. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs>